Welcome to MLOps Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and MLOps. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Welcome back to MLOps Live. I'm Sabine and I'm joined by my co-host Steven. Hi everyone. Hey Steven. This is an interactive Q&A, so if you have any questions for our guest, please just raise your hand here in Zoom and we'll read your question as soon as possible. If you want to ask anonymously, you can also send a DM directly to me and I will be picking your question up. And you can also write in the normal chat if you uh, have any question to our guest, so feel free to type there as well. Our guest today is Marcin Tushinsky, who is currently a data scientist at Respo Vision, a consulting firm that revolutionizes football with the help of artificial intelligence. And Marcin also has almost a decade of experience in the tech industry. He's held research and analytics positions in companies such as Allegro and Ernst & Young. So welcome to the show, Marcin. Hi there. Thank you for having me. It's very good to have you here. Could you maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm mainly a self-taught data scientist uh, with some academic background from the real statistics. Uh, I did also manage to get a, I did also graduate in finance and accounting, but fortunately I'm not working in that field right now. Um, so I sort of went through the whole process of transition from data analyst through research engineer to data scientist or the other way around, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, I arrived at Respo uh, where I can finally work on something that I truly love, that is football. Uh, and I'm leading a team of data scientists here and we're working on core deep learning models uh, that compose our main processing pipeline. Right, so it's about kind of like enhancing the enjoyment side or the entertainment side of, of football, right? Um, it's more or... about more about extracting all the possible data that we can. So the idea for Respo Vision is to gather all the data about players, well, how they are running, where they are on the field in each moment uh, from a single camera feed. That's what sort of makes Respo different from other companies that provide data that we are not using our own setup on the stadiums. Uh, we can use a broadcast camera or we can use some other example, like panoramic camera we receive that we receive from our clients and then extract 3D data of all players on the field uh, just from that. I see. And uh, could you go into a little deeper at just your, your role? You mentioned you have a team there at Respo. Um, yeah, we are working on, uh, let's call them the core deep learning models. This is basically uh, detection, segmentation, player tracking, player recognition, mm -hmm. uh, identification. Um, well, there's also pitch estimation and some uh, other minor, uh, minor areas that we are working on. And what we're trying to do is sort of iterate uh, with providing even better models with each iteration uh, for every step, as our system right now is composed of like several blocks uh, that in the end lead to providing 3D positional data. That sounds very cool. And we're going to go into the questions uh, here now from the community with, uh, with Steven. Thanks for um, sharing that, uh, Marcin. And thanks, Sabine. Um, I think we'll just start off with really understanding some of the problems that you solve at Respo Vision so that gives a context to um, the episode. Um, okay. Um, so as I said previously, uh, what Respo Vision is aimed at is extracting 3D positional data. So where players mm. have each of their hands, feet, and so on at, in every frame of the video of the game that we get. Uh, so in order to get there, we have to tackle multiple machine learning problems uh, from first from classification to actually run our system on proper uh, proper frames where, where we can uh, detect players and so on. Then detection, segmentation, tracking those players, extracting key points uh, up to post estimation uh, and key points estimation uh, in uh, in 3D. So that's like the, the main idea. But this is obviously just the tip of the iceberg uh, because we have much more 
uh, much more going on with both our online and offline uh, processing pipelines. So right now we are working on both online processing where we can provide, uh, let's say, majority of the data that I mentioned previously live uh, for the clubs, for example, to analyze the game as it's going on. Uh, but also we have an offline pipeline where we can provide a bit more accurate data uh, together with the 3D uh, key points with the 3D positional data uh, later on. So this is a whole system that's split into two parts. Uh, and also there is a layer of data where we are trying to gather everything and store it what, sort of uh, in an organized manner, which is not that easy when, it's, uh, when we're talking about uh, video or images uh, data sets. Yeah, so these are the problems that we have uh, addressed provision and that we are trying to, to solve. All right, and, and beyond uh, machine learning techniques, are there other particular technologies or techniques that you leverage to solve these problems? We're using a few, uh, few frameworks, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. aside from, from machine learning, yeah. uh, modes like Torch, uh, we are using Kedro pipelines for our processing. Uh, this was true up until, let's say, a month ago. Uh, because we stopped using Kedro, uh, we developed our own system uh, to run uh, machine learning pipelines or MLOps pipelines. Uh, as we found that Kedro is not necessarily scaling well with what we have. Uh, there were uh, several issues that we had, for example, with loading of all of the data sets. So the startup of the whole Kedro framework was very slow. And in the end, each processing pipeline took like a minute or two to simply load everything and check if everything is there. Uh, right now, we don't have this uh, disadvantage with our new system. And as I, as I said, our system is built from several blocks. So if you have like mm -hmm. 80 steps to, to, to cover, then adding a minute or two on each step really amounts to, to some time uh, that we are losing. Uh, so we skipped uh, using Kedro. Uh, right now, mm -hmm. uh, all our pipelines for the offline offline version are running on Argo. Uh, Argo pipeline, it's um, like an overlay on Kubernetes and uh, it's, it's working well. Uh, it, it allows us to, to scale up uh, all of our processing. Uh, for, the online, uh, for the online system, we have our own solution. Uh, that is quite efficient. Uh, right now, we are able to provide majority of the of the information uh, yeah. in real time for 8K uh, 8K input. So that's right. And that's these are all purely supporting machine learning pipelines, right? Uh, yeah, in in, mm -hmm. in majority, yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I mean, you've given us a, a glimpse into, you know, some of the challenges and, you know, one is the optimization problem you talked about with Enkedro. So what are some of the other big challenges, you know, you face with running uh, computer vision systems at scale uh, in production from development to production? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I would say that one of the biggest problems when it comes to running computer vision, uh, computer vision systems is the data quality that we receive. Uh, often if it's, uh, if it's like a streaming data, uh, then the stream can, can fail. We can receive, we can have some, 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 some gaps within that and our system has to, uh, has to be able to handle it, uh, handle it which wasn't uh, as easy for us at the beginning uh, as it will seem. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's one issue. Uh, another problem that we that we had was sort of um, using the same uh, the same models when we were uh, training them and creating new ones and then deploying to production. Because, for example, if we wanted to add some new new feature, uh, we had to update some third party libraries and it would not go well with our main uh, production pipeline. Uh, so this was a huge issue. This is where sort of Torch script comes in uh, to sort of separate whole the whole idea of training machine learning models from the production deployment system. Uh, so it's really not related. So we'd have a separate code base for each one and then just use one sort of compiled model uh, that is just used for inference uh, in the production system. Um, so that was uh, that was another issue that we had. Also, also another thing, especially when it comes to to processing uh, video data, to processing video video data, 
uh, is sort of fault tolerance. For example, if we receive data that our model said, okay, this is a good data that we can go through to the next step, but in reality, uh, there is like, for example, we have a frame of the game where there are no detections of the players because, for example, it was a zoom on someone on the stands or something like that. And it went through for our filtering, uh, for our first filtering step. So in the next step, there is a detection. Then we try to apply some so several advancements on, based on those detections and there is nothing in there. So the system has to be able to cope with the fact that the, the data is missing and not start throwing errors that we didn't uh, prepare for that. Other issues when deploying uh, computer vision systems, uh, I would say to have more, uh, more memory than estimated uh, because it's uh, always, always an issue. I mean, uh, we always tested our system extensively uh, and in the end, we often needed more memory than expected, for example. Well, one example would be if we're, when we are using external frameworks like MM detection or Detectron, um, we had issues with, with detection and segmentation. Uh, because during the during the break, when all the substitute players went onto the field, uh, went onto the field and basically started warming up and so on, uh, suddenly we had like 60 detections instead of 22. And if we have 60 detections, then every consecutive model would require more memory to store that information, and we didn't account for that, for example. Uh, so that's 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 another issue. Um, yeah, I think that those are uh, those are few of the most important. Yeah, and and I think if you ask any small team or maybe even mid scale team or hyper scale team, it's always the infrastructure case that's the issue because you know to run these models, you probably need uh, GPUs or or yeah. how, how do you sort of optimize your models to not just use lesser resources, but also optimize, um, how do I call it, uh, uh, use fewer resources sort of, and, you know, but also ensure that you don't trade off all the accuracy, right, for trying to use smaller yeah. memory, yeah. Yeah, so um, we've, we sort of try to separate separate all of our models from the rest of the data processing. So this is the part of uh, our system uh, where we try to keep the data processing in a single sort of executor and then have another executor that does only the GPU-based uh, based part and pass the data along to another one and another one and another one. Uh, so the idea is that we know what GPUs are available, for example, A10's uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs. Uh, we know how much memory they've got, uh, and we sort of try to set the limit there. So for example, if we know that uh, currently, I don't know, ResNet uh, 50 would be the maximum that we can insert, we are not trying to go any further and see, well, maybe having a bigger model would be better, but then we would have to get another GPU, maybe try pruning this model, try quantizing it. But it always ends up with, uh, okay, but if we are going to somehow make this model smaller, we will lose quality. So we simply try not to go there in the first place, just to stick to the, to the smallest model possible uh, in order not to be well, sad when the quality uh, goes down. Great, great. And thanks for asking. And I, I think when we started this conversation, you talked about something uh, in the sphere of data and uh, talking about data quality, I meant. And I'm sort of curious, how do you deal with large data sets in, in your computer vision systems, even in, like not just during development when, you know, you run the training, but also when, you know, the same is out there in the wild, you know, in the field, uh, in the football match, processing data from different um, sources. Okay, so um, the first the first thing the, the data quality um, it's sort of an, an issue that we had for quite some quite some time. I mean, if you think about, for example, player identification, then if we had a low resolution, for example, 1080p, then the player in the far corner would have like 20 by 10 pixels. Uh, it would be his size. So actually knowing who the player is would be impossible. So we sort of try to prepare our system in few versions for different uh, data quality. And we sort of have an estimate basically from our experience, uh, depending on the source. So for example, we know that this provider uh, of the video would provide us with 
such quality and we can pick the correct uh, the correct setting for the system to run smoothly and how that answers this question you know, your question yeah uh, th th that works as well and in terms of the the storage aspects as well is he is are these things i think these are real-time um processing right they happen in real time they don't yeah. happen in batches okay okay and what's what are sort of the challenges that you know that happens with real-time data streaming in that sense because you know i think the architecture would have to be they are different compared to applications that use sort of batch data run the processing and then send the results later what are some of those challenges you face with that real-time processing system um with real-time processing i think one of the biggest challenges is to keep them in order sort of because if you have like temporal models or temporal parts of the system that has to take into account what was happening a frame before and right now then it has to run sequentially so basically if you have we have any any part of the system that does that this is sort of our our worst point that's our performance every other model is probably twice as fast or three times as fast but we also have to slow down to the slowest uh, to the slowest part and this is especially tricky because in the end the video that we sort of send back at the end has to be in order so uh, this is a constraint that we are using for example if we were uh, running an offline pipeline uh, this wouldn't be an issue and it would be much faster uh, than it is right now uh, i mean as I, as i said at the moment we can uh, we can run a 8k uh, 8K resolution uh, video uh, live in more than 20 frames per second. Uh, so, so that's quite an achievement, but we could do better if it wasn't for few uh, few temporal models that actually require this order of the frames uh, to be precise. And uh, I don't know if it's going to be part of it, but maybe just give give us an idea of what those temporal models are. You know, what are temporal models in this context? Um, for for example, player tracking uh, would be one thing. So basically, we have a one frame and then another, and we have to uh, match which player in the frame T plus one uh, was in the player in the frame T. So this is a sort of part of the system that has to get those frames in such order. We cannot get first the frame T plus one, then the frame T, because it wouldn't work. Uh, so that's sort of uh, one idea of of of, uh, of such model. Another one would be a camera tracking. So when we have a broadcast information, then we have to track uh, at which part of the of the pitch we are actually looking at the moment. Uh, so this is much easier if we are actually tracking the movement of the camera instead of sort of calibrating on which part of the of the pitch we are looking at uh, every frame. Right. Thank you for sharing that. So I think we can jump right into some of the questions from the, uh, the community. So first question, uh, this person asks, can you discuss a specific project where you faced MLOps challenges in computer vision? I know you've talked about that, or do you have another context or example? Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I would like to go back to, to, to the previous company I worked for, uh, Allegro. Uh, it's, it's like, it's a huge e-commerce company, the, the biggest one in Poland. Uh, and we're working on a visual search engine uh, for Allegro, uh, which was a bit troublesome because there is a lot of data that we have. And it's not necessarily, it wasn't, well, it wasn't because it's changing still. Uh, it wasn't necessarily that organized uh, as you'd think. Uh, because it's, well, it, Allegro wasn't exactly like Amazon and we had not only shops, but also uh, like regular uh, regular people selling there. So we didn't have all the, uh, all the items uh, properly classified. We sort of thought of them as offers. So those were just offerings from different people, different shops uh, and so on. And also if you think about visual search um, for e-commerce, it's still sort of a gimmick. It's not exactly a feature that is crucial uh, to the existence of such platform. So it was a nice feature. We wanted to, to add it. Uh, we started working on, on the models from the fashion from the fashion department because we thought that people would look for for, for, for clothes, for stuff like that, uh, using uh, using pictures. And in the end they did, but that's that's a whole different story. But our biggest problem was actually testing those models, right? So when we were training models, it was fairly simple. Uh, we would train those models in sort of a uh, similarity 
uh, manner. So we would get embeddings for each offer uh, and then simply find the nearest neighbor to that embedding uh, in our offer database. But for the testing, uh, especially with new models, it was quite hard. We were sort of accustomed to using A-B testing uh, previously in the regular textual search, and we wanted to use that in the visual search. But as I said, it was a gimmick. It was a novelty. So many people were just using it for fun. So they were taking pictures of stuff that we couldn't possibly have and then click on something that they thought was funny. So A-B testing was not entirely plausible for us because it, it, it just didn't provide uh, accurate results. Uh, also sort of testing it uh, synthetically on smaller data sets didn't work well. Uh, and finally, what we had to do to, uh, to sort of make sure that the new models are proper and they are better than the ones that the, they were before, uh, we had to develop whole app that ran on production or like on the side of Allegra, another microservice uh, that we would uh, that we would use internally. Uh, our uh, internal annotators would use it, and simply there was a like another version of the visual search that was available in the app on the phone. Uh, it was available for on the on some on the website, uh, some light uh, light interface, and they would simply go for a set of of images that they made see the results from the old model, see the results from the new model, and select uh, all the ones that were proper. And then we could assess if the model is actually better on the whole database of all offers that we had uh, available. So it was, well, it was a bit unusual uh, because to, in order to test a new feature, we had to develop a whole new way of testing it uh, instead of using what we had previously and also just synthetic tests uh, weren't, weren't enough. Uh, there was a correlation between them, but it wasn't uh, as good as we would have hoped. So we had to go through, the, through, the, through this process uh, every time we had a new model. And was that sustainable in any sense? Um, I, I wouldn't say that was sustainable, but I think that over time, when people stopped playing with the visual search and started mm. using it, uh, A-B testing, uh, became more feasible uh, than, than it was at the beginning. Uh, so I hope that right now they don't have to use this app anymore because the front end I wrote was horrible. Yeah. Uh, what are some roadblocks specific to testing CV pipelines for production? Roadblocks specific to testing computer vision pipelines. This is basically what I, what I said um, previously. We cannot sort of prepare for what's coming. The, the data input that we can think about the, the images for visual search, the, the video of the game that we get, uh, we can think of many things, but in the end, the users will always surprise us. So the system has to sort of be, um, well, this, that's the ugly saying, garbage in, garbage out. So we have to sort of be able to tell the user that, okay, this won't work. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing I would say um, when it comes to testing, it's like simple stuff like connection quality. Sometimes when we were running our live system, uh, the biggest issue was actually the, the speed at which we were getting the data to the system, not the speed at which the system could actually process the data. So we could be ready for an 8K uh, video quality deployment, but in the end we had to run with like 4K or 1080p uh, quality because we, we, we couldn't receive a better one. Yeah, so those are some, some roadblocks. Also, it's often hard to, well, let's say test the system uh, when we don't have like real world, real, real world data. Uh, I mean, for example, for the visual search, uh, when we were working on it, we had to actually our team had to go around our houses because this was during the pandemic. And we are taking uh, photos of stuff that we have at home to use it as our test data set uh, to analyze what we can possibly get. Yeah. So those are some roadblocks. Yeah, that, that was that was good improvisation. <laughs> good improvisation in that sense. And uh, yeah, um, so I think we have a question. Yes, we do have a question from uh, or, or on, on LinkedIn from Adrian Matei. He is asking, Marcin, do you have any fully automated ML pipelines in production? 
such as automated retraining, orchestration based on triggers, feedback loops, CICD? Um, okay, so we have continuous test, sort of we have continuous testing. So basically that's, that's one of the places that we are using Neptune AI. Uh, basically before every, every release, every merge to the, to the master branch, um, we are running a set of, a set of tests uh for each of the of the models for the whole system if it works properly and then we are using neptune to store uh store this the, the, such information uh, for later on uh this proved to be quite quite useful more than a few times uh because we could go back to the historical results uh, and see how our models improved on some held out data set that was just there for the uh, continuous testing. For the automated like training, uh, training models, uh, we don't have that at the moment. I think that we are sort of still in the phase where we change the architecture of the, of the models uh, so rapidly and so often that we cannot uh, rely on automatic process to do this for us. Awesome. Thanks, Marcin. And thank you, Adrian, for the question. Great. Um, yeah, back to the community questions. And just in line with the, the testing, I think it's also crucial I bring up this question from um, Kimo from the community who asked, um, how do you plan for reliability of your systems in production, your CV systems in production? Um, so I assume things like ensuring, you talked about fault tolerance earlier, or ensuring yeah. like, um, how do I call it, outages and problems, avoiding things around Yes. So um, right now, what we what we are doing, I mean, I'm, I'm, I will be trying to focus here on the online uh, on the online system because the offline processing is a bit different story. So right now, what we are basically doing is when we have something going live, we have more than one uh, clone of our whole system running. So if anything fails with one machine, we can seamlessly change to, to another one which has already the same information, it's just not sending the output uh, back. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing to test how reliable the system is, especially with machine learning, uh, is to, for example, feed some old videos, old videos with some additional information. So for example, some, I don't know, highlights from different games for for example, 24 hours. We did this test when we started running our system, our system live uh, in, in high quality. So we basically took a few games and ran them for 24 hours straight and uh, checked if the system works. I mean, if it works for 24 hours, then it's our best guess that it will work for the 90 minutes uh, of the game itself. So those were those are our, our ideas uh, to check the reliability. Yeah, and, um, and also... Are there infrastructure, obviously, aside from, you know, running out of memory when they, the, uh, when doing the analytics and stuff, but are there other infrastructure related problems that people should be worried about um, when these systems are online? Um, okay, so we had like few problems with the storage available. Uh, this was actually a bit... Well, it was actually well, maybe not funny. Anyway, the the problem was that we had uh, we had not enough enough storage to store the video of the game because if you think about a game in 8K quality, uh, it takes a lot of a lot of memory, like half a terabyte of data. So that's something that we weren't prepared for, and we have to we had to quickly set up a new machine with much bigger hard drive uh, and then get it up and running uh, on there. So this is always the case with, uh, with, with videos and with images. Also, somewhere within our, well, this is an annotation process. This is not the live processing pipeline. Uh, we, we have something, well, it enables us to quickly annotate uh, or quickly identify players uh, for model training to, or to improve data that we have. But this basically, it basically looks like a few players in a row and you have like many different tracks from the game. And in the end, we res uh, obtained an image that was so huge that it wasn't possible to open it in any known to me, at least, software because it was too huge that it would uh, it not would go in. It had like 700,000 pixels 
uh, of uh, height. So basically all software said, okay, no, I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to open this. Uh, and this was a bit tricky because for our annotation team, we had to sort of take it back, cut it into pieces, send it again. Uh, and this was the first time that we actually saw uh, such problem. Oh, quite interested. All right. So uh, we have uh, another question from a community member who is currently working in a video analytics system and they are about to deploy to production. And uh, for them, you know, first timers, what are some challenges they should expect running the system in production? First timers. Um, okay. So basically covering what, what we, yeah, everything that we said, said previously. Mm -hmm. So the input data quality, um, there's also the case of properly decoding the data. Uh, I mean, if you have like unstable stream, it's possible that some parts won't get through and then you'll receive like empty data within the video. This throws many libraries off uh, and they basically say, okay, I'm not going to decode this. Uh, so you have to have to account for that. So this is, uh, this is one of the, one of the issues. Another one is not to rely um, very heavily on what's working offline. I mean, we also have our like, sort of uh, simulated version of our uh, online system, but in the end, uh, it never works exactly the same as the, the online one. So it's important to run such tests, for example, on some uh, simulated video feed, but running like in the full operational online manner uh, instead of trying to think, okay, what would, would, what would happen uh, if we had the simulation and try it offline? Uh, so that's that's one thing to to keep in mind, and also to check if maybe some parts of the system are well really necessary. Uh, I mean, for this is sort of the case of development versus production. Uh, so let's think about it. Uh, okay, uh, maybe let's let's use an example. It will be, it will be easier. Uh, so for example, we have a pipeline that does team recognition. Basically, takes all the players on the pitch and splits them into proper teams. Uh, so this is quite uh, quite tricky because it's working in an unsupervised manner uh, online during the game. So because we cannot actually prepare for that before before the game, and we have like loads of informations that we try to save for analysis, for debugging, for development. But for the production system, uh, we are sort of cutting everything off, everything out. Uh, that we are not using. So this is like an, like an issue that we had for quite some time that we kept the, the data and it slowed us down. Uh, so right now, like putting a, a line between the development part and the production part and turning this uh, development parts off uh, makes much more sense uh, and the system is uh, much lighter. Great. And you mentioned some drift in performance there. And I think that's that's a very common thing when it comes to running the systems of production. And how do you sort of manage that whereby, you know, your system has this certain level of performance that's satisfactory in production, but when you deploy it, there's that model drift in quotes that has. So how do you sort of handle that discrepancy between performance and production and training versus what you get in production for the systems? Um, okay, so um, I would say that sort of the model drift um, is not happening in our case because the, the football games are not changing that rapidly. If we had such models as like sort of static player recognition that we have a database of, of embeddings for each player and then we are using them to identify, okay, that's Lionel Messi, that's Cristiano Ronaldo and so on and so on, uh, that would be an issue. The same would go for the teams. But right now we are doing all of that uh, in an unsupervised manner online and simply we're relying on extracting the numbers from player jerseys to identify them properly. Uh, so this is not the, not the case, but we had like few, few issues with maybe not so model, not model drift as, as such, uh, but related. Uh, so to give one example, um, we had a problem with detection where in our, this is more maybe related to bias in the data. Uh, we had some, uh, we had we had few games that we used for model training. Uh, we had few games that we used for the model training and the referee was always wearing either a black shirt or a yellow one. And the next, then the next game that we actually used our system on, the referee had a blue shirt and the goalkeeper had a yellow one. So basically the model saw only referee in those two colors. So he said, okay, the, the goalkeeper is the referee 
and the referee is the goalkeeper because those colors did switch. So uh, that's something that we didn't account for. Right now, we are trying to sort of keep such things in mind and check uh, what kits the referees will have, the goalkeepers will have, and ensure that we have everything in our data set. Um, and talking about bias, also another well, sort of funny example here would be the yellow ball that is during the winter uh, part of the season. So it's visible on the snow. So basically the model learns that the ball is white and then he sees a yellow ball, then he's trying to pick on something else. For example, player shoes or, uh, or player head, if they have like white hair, uh, for example, Neymar had like a short white hair for, for a moment and our model picked it up as, uh, as ball. Yeah, so that's that's more about data data bias, but uh, it's the the closest thing that we have to to to, to the model drift uh, at the moment. Yeah, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's uh that's understandable. And um, in a uh, like, how many pipelines are typically going to be running in just one football match? Because I feel like there are a lot of things that are different processes that are involved in this. Uh, yeah, we have like I'm not sure like on forty pipelines that yeah. have to that have to run to actually produce the final final data set, but it may be more. Uh, we are still in the process of sort of merging some some of the models mm -hmm. and also the fact that we moved from Kedro to our own uh, our own system uh, made it possible to actually split those pipelines into more parts because right now as we don't have any overhead for starting them then we can try to to make them as atomic as possible awesome we do have a question again on LinkedIn from Vishnu Lal this time. He wants to know a little bit about data annotation you might be using, such as bounding boxes or polygons. Okay. Um, so for data annotation, we are using uh, the CVAT tool. Uh, I guess it's quite, quite well known in the community. And we have a team of annotators here uh, in internally. Uh, and I do think that they play a crucial part in creating our pipelines because basically many tasks require some sort of football knowledge. Uh, and also I think that this is the, one of the biggest problems when it comes to computer vision when working with data uh, is the data ambiguity. So basically, for example, how much of the player do we have to see on the on the frame to actually label him? Is it just one leg? Is it one leg and one arm? And then we are saying, okay, he's there, but just part of him is outside of the of the image. Uh, so sort of keeping in touch with the with our internal annotation team makes it possible to set some threshold and arrive at certain understanding of what we need. Uh, and I think that over time, uh, it got much easier. And whenever we are sending data outside to annotate, uh, we often have to either provide a lot of examples to, to get there uh, or simply then uh, correct those, those annotations. And uh, answering the part, uh, what, sir, what sort of data we are annotating, uh, that's mainly bounding boxes, uh, but also identities. And this is sort of the part that requires some knowledge about football because uh, as i said previously for if we had a poor quality video then recognizing the players from uh, from the stills is sometimes nearly impossible i'm not able to do this properly most of the time and somehow they can so uh, i guess kudos to them awesome thank you for the question vishnu yeah and and Masin, apart from experiment tracking you know are there other ml ops components uh, uh, that use under the hood that's not quite obvious maybe like feature stores or things like that to solve some of these challenges at the moment we are not using anything like that i mean as our system has to run mainly live uh then we it's not, not well we don't have the need to to store such uh such information uh, obviously we are using we are using our own our own system we are using neptune for models training for continuous testing uh, we are using cvat for data labeling uh we have argo um we are using at the moment also torch script which i think is quite quite well i'd say it's crucial to creating scalable systems what else? Obviously, we are using Docker, uh, but I think that's not, not exactly an uh, MLOps uh, specific tooling. Um, what I, if I'm thinking about MLOps, uh, one of the parts would be um, creating a 
a stable environment for the system to run in, right? So Docker is one part. So setting properly the system uh, to have proper version of drivers in a, repli a replicable manner uh, to set it mm. in any cloud that we want is one part, but another one is, for example, using proper uh, package manager. So for some quite for quite some time, we're using uh, Pip and Anaconda uh, to do this. But in the end, uh, Pip was quite slow. That that was one issue. Uh, on the other hand, Anaconda was quite unstable. I mean, running the same tw running the, the same pipeline twice of creating the environment and installing everything would pr could produce different results, and this was something that we couldn't rely on. Uh, so right now we moved to Poetry. Uh, that's like, uh, like I think that's the newest package manager for Python. Uh, that's that's available. Uh, it's vaguely based on the ideas taken from Rust, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, from Cargo, the Rust packet manager. Yeah, so that's something that that I can definitely recommend uh, to sort of make sure that uh, all of the libraries and the setup is done properly. I guess that, that that's it. And and from from the outside, I see that you know rep reproducibility. Uh, is, is is very crucial for your workflow. If I'm not mistaken, yes, being able to yeah, being able to reproduce results and so so I'm, I'm sort of thinking, are there specific things that you know that prevents that from happening? Because you know you talked about the, the package manager now, and uh, I was sort of curious, was that a hardware challenge that made it difficult for you know these uh, the, the results to be you know uh, vastly different uh, that made it easy for the results to be vastly different? Or what are those difficulties that you know that you face with reproducing your results? Um, okay, so one of the I don't know if I got the question right, but one of the one of the issues that we have when processing large amounts of data uh, is actually the the cloud could be the cloud provider. For example, if we don't have that many machines uh, available with GPUs, so this is this is like uh, this is an issue, and we are using multiple multiple clouds at the moment to run our processing pipelines. Uh, to be able to deliver the data in, uh, well, to deliver the data quickly. Could you repeat the part about the, the quality? Because you've said something about the the, qual the output quality, if I'm mistaken. Yes, yes. Uh, the output quality, right? Because I feel when you run the training, right, yeah. you want to make sure that, you know, the, the re results that you, you get are reproducible, right? The data sets you sort of extract from these football matches. Are, I, I'm, I'm sort of wondering what are the barriers that prevent that repeats related to that, um, that particular process? Okay, so one thing would be the data processing, like the, the pre-processing of the, of the data that comes into the models. So as it often is, like within our pipeline where we train the model, uh, we come up with like some clever way of processing the data that later on is not applicable in our live system. So we sort of have to first sit down with our software developers, uh, our DevOps engineers, uh, and simply sort of come to understanding of what kind of data that we can get, what uh, processing we can apply there, and then uh, we have to train model based on that. Also, like there's, there's another part because we are creating models, but then we are sort of using whole modules. So for example, we have a model that predicts where certain parts of the pitch are, uh, for example, the corners, all the lines and stuff, uh, stuff like that. But then we have a whole module that actually turns that information into a proper projection of what's happening on the screen onto the 2D plane of the pitch uh, and also does the camera tracking. So basically what we have to do uh, is run a set of experiments uh, that are using the module and run set of experiments that are using the model and compare the metrics between one another to make sure that those are aligned. So if we are getting a better model on some synthetic data, then the module that's running later on in the, in the production pipeline also will get better results. Uh, so this was, for example, the case with, with, with PIT geometry, uh, where the quality of our projection uh, wasn't as good as, as it could have been. And it turns out that we had some differences in the, the way that we processed images uh, and checking if those metrics were aligned, like between our uh, machine learning training and then the deployment part, 
uh, allowed us to find uh, those discrepancies. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Thank you. And, and then you, you spoke about, you know, all the software developers and engineers involved. And I'm sort of wondering, because one of the key aspects of MLOps is just generally the people, the team itself. So, you know, what are the challenges with cross-team collaboration where you have to collaborate with the software developer to maybe move the models to integrate it with the production system or the data engineer? What are those challenges that teams should be aware of, people should be aware of when, when it comes to, you know, deploying these systems? Okay, so I think that one of the one of the biggest challenges is to sort of come coming to an understanding of what we are trying to achieve. One thing would be to create a system that can deploy many machine learning models, but whole another story is to uh, create a team that knows why those machine learning models are there and what we are trying to achieve. Uh, and I think that at Respo we sort of achieved this. Uh, I think that we don't have any like any problems between us creating the models and software develop developers introducing them into the into our pipeline. Maybe this is the case of working in a startup and a small company where uh, we work closely. But also, uh, I think that it's quite uh, quite an important aspect to uh, keep those code bases apart. As long as sort of we are able to to create models uh, apart from like on the side of the main production system and then simply feed those models there uh, it's much easier uh, and then we just have to set some set of rules for how for what data is going into the models great all right awesome so we have a, a another question from community member who is asking uh what are some of the key trends and emerging technologies in computer vision that you think would have a significant impact in the coming years? Um, okay, so I will try not to talk about GPT-4 here, <laughs> obviously, um, but I think that that's a bit um, that's a bit the direction that we are going in. I mean, computer vision is sort of at the moment following what's happening in NLP and then transferring such knowledge uh, to, to vision problems. But in, from sort of another perspective, uh, I think that one one major aspect that will be crucial in, in the upcoming years will be creating end-to-end -end models. As I said, we had like 40 different uh, 40, 40 different parts of our system. And what we're trying to work on now is actually merging them into like 10. So we, could, we are trying to merge multiple models uh, into one, uh, sort of in form of like multitask learning uh, or end-to-end -end, uh, model training. And this is becoming more and more popular. Uh, I recently saw a publication from Beijing University. It was called Motion Bird. Uh, which sort of incorporated both person detection, key points detection, and then uh, 3D estimation, and I think also um, action recognition, all within one model. So I think that's the way that that's the direction that everything will go go to because it simply works better now that we have bigger models. Uh, that we have data that is we have models that can be more contextual. Uh, then using multiple tasks at once, just as in NLP, uh, will work much better. We saw that recently because we used to have different models for player detection, for ball detection, numbers detection, and stuff like that. Uh, and merging them within one made sense and uh, actually improved the results, also reduced the computational overhead and uh, energy consumption. Just going back to one of your answers earlier, um, yeah. where, where, where you talked about one of the failures of the system, which is the bias, you know, when it lens recognized balls are just white. And then, you know, when there's an odd outlier, it becomes, uh, I'm so worried. Um, I'm so thinking from, this is a community question, by the way. And so I'm thinking, yeah. how do you handle the biases uh, with these systems to make sure that, you know, they, they can, you know, whenever there's an outlier type of scenario like that, they can also catch that situation? Um, okay. So, I mean, I guess that handling the bias in the, in the video data or images data sets is a bit more troublesome than in some other in some other cases. Uh, that's also thanks to the data ambiguity. I mean, where is the, the line that we are actually classifying something? Uh, for example, uh, one great example would be labeling people in a crowd. I mean, if we can see like a leg that's somewhere behind the person and then a, a hand on the other side, 
how do we label them? Do we keep just one hand? Do we produce a whole bounding box around the, the whole person? Uh, that's, that's a bit ambiguous and it introduces some form of bias. So if our data was labeled sort of improperly, for example, we had just half of the player labeled when he was, occlud he was occluded by another one, then uh, it will end up within the model and in our final uh, data. And I think that for data related to football, there is no other way than gather as much data as possible. I mean, what we are trying to do basically is to have like an even split between different leagues, different stadiums, different weathers, uh, different kits. Uh, actually, kits is a bit of a tricky part because we had some issues with recognizing teams especially with low quality input, uh, because when we had low quality input and we had low quality of segmentation. Uh, and for example, our segmentation mask would cover part of the part of the grass uh, as well as the kit. And then the color of the kit, if you were to average it, uh, would always be brown, no matter what, what kit the, the team had. Yeah, so fighting the, fighting the bias here is just about gathering as diverse data as we can uh, get our hands on. Great. So yeah, we have a one on the personal side and this person asks, how do you stay up to date with the latest trends and technologies and MLOs for computer vision? What resources do you rely on? Uh, honestly, I think that I cannot keep up with everything that's coming out. Uh, I think that like uh, <laughs> uh, my, my main like source of information uh, is the medium daily digest, like the top five articles. Mm. Uh, uh, it's, it's always, I mean, just reading the headlines is sometimes enough to know that something happening and it's worth checking out. Uh, outside of that, I follow the YouTube channel of Two Minute, two minute Papers. Uh, so mm. this is also sort of always like if there is some, some, some breaking change coming, it will be there. Uh, and also I try to stay, uh, uh, to stay updated about what's happening on conferences like CVPR or ICML uh, to see what papers are, uh, are published there. So I guess that those are the three, three main sources, but I'm quite certain that I cannot keep up with all the tools that, uh, that show up. Yes, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Masson. Awesome. I guess we're ready to wrap up here. But before that, Marcin, uh, thanks so much for joining us. And would you like to tell people how they can follow you and maybe connect with you online? I mean, I'm, I'm available on LinkedIn and you can always drop me an email at marcin.tuszyński at Respovision. Um, so that's that's a way to, to reach me, but I guess LinkedIn uh, would, be, would be fine. Awesome. Thank you for answering uh, all the questions today. So this was our last episode of season one of the Neptune AI podcast, where Stephen and I host a live Q&A with various MLOx practitioners. And the next season will actually feature our CEO, Piotr, and our platform guru, Aurimas, uh, hosting the discussion. And it will be more platform oriented. So uh, do not miss the next season. Stephen and I will be thanking you for the company thus far. It's been a pleasure, Stephen. Same here. Same here, Stephen. It's been a pleasure talking to MLOps practitioners doing real world stuff and, you know, sharing those insights with you live and um, over a recorded podcast as well. Certainly. And uh, we're not going anywhere. You can stay in touch with us uh, in the MLOps community Slack as well. And you will hear uh, from us here at Neptune AI again very soon. So do follow us on socials for more updates. We're especially active on LinkedIn. But until next time, take care. Bye bye. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. And you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcast. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time.